Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. We're bringing back this podcast after a short break, and we have some great guests lined up for you over the next few months. We are hoping that you learn a lot as we have incorporated many of the suggestions you made to try and improve the podcast. Please let us know if you have any other suggestions on how to make the podcast more enjoyable. We know you have unlimited ways to spend your time, so we really appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. If you have any thoughts, you can check out runnersconnect.net slash podcast to submit your questions for future podcasts or to give us a call. We will always let you know a week in advance of who we're going to have on the next show so you can find out and let us know what you think. My name is Tina Muir. I am the new host of the podcast. You may have noticed the increase in social media through mostly Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest and Instagram. That's me as the community manager for Runners Connect and I'm hoping you do not mind the British accent. I'm originally from England and I'm an elite runner living in America with my fiancé Steve. I'm very excited that we get to begin our first podcast of 2015 during the our unofficial start of Boston Marathon Training Week. You may have noticed we're sharing a lot of new articles this week, including a great one on the 10 tips to tame the hills of Boston from Matt Fitzgerald, which we featured on Monday. I know a lot of you are a huge fan of his and it really is a great article. This Friday we will be hosting a link up for bloggers to add their post about starting Boston Marathon training. If you have a blog we would love if you could join in. If not, then you can just read up on what others are up to. Today we have a very special guest, someone who plays a rather important role in the success of the Boston Marathon, race director Dave McGillivray. Now to learn a little bit more about Dave, it's difficult to know where to start. He is the Boston Marathon Race Director and has been since 1981, but he's also the Race Director for Beach to Beacon and Falmouth. Some of you may have raced this in the past. It would be hard to pick a career highlight for him with so many impressive feats to his name. In 1978, Dave ran from Medford, Oregon to Medford, Massachusetts, a total of 3,452 miles to raise thousands for the Jimmy Fund and the Dana-Faber Cancer Institute. In 1982, Dave ran Boston in a 314 marathon blindfolded to raise over 10,000 for the Carroll Center for the Blind. Every year, Dave runs his age in miles, and he has done since he was 12, including 60 in 2014. Last year, Dave competed in the Ironman World Championships in Kona, finishing in 1334. And other impressive feats he has to his name are that he is a motivational speaker who does talks all over the country, and he has written a book named The Last Pick. You will hear a little bit about this from Dave in his interview, but it is about in his childhood when he was picked last because of his small stature. And the overall theme of the book is to never underestimate your ability to set and achieve goals. Very inspiring. There's much too much to mention about Dave, but you can learn more about him on his website, dmsesports.com. So before we begin, I just want to apologize for the quality in some parts of this interview. As I mentioned, this is my first podcast and we did have some technical issues. Future interviews will be a much higher quality and we hope you will be patient with this episode as there is some echoing when I ask the questions. That's just more reason for me to be a little more quiet and let our guests talk, I guess. Um, Thanks again for listening. We appreciate your time. That's enough from me. Let's meet our guest. Welcome, Dave. Thank you for joining us on the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I just spoke about all your accomplishments. You have a very impressive running resume. Clearly, you like a challenge. Do you think runners become addicted to pushing their limits and looking for more, almost like adrenaline junkies? Well, I think it's human nature... I think for most people to want to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. Um, It was funny, uh, for years and years and years, people would ask me what I want to do for a living. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't have a good answer. And um, about a year ago, I was driving into Boston on the highway and I saw a billboard and it had one word on it. And that's when I really realized 
what I wanted to do in life. And the word said, accomplisher. I said, that's it. That's what I want to be. I want to be an accomplisher. I want to accomplish things. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's just that, you know, if you have a passion about something, you want to set goals and and targets and, and accomplish them. So I just think, generally speaking, it's human nature to want to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the runners are concerned, um, you know, obviously they have to be driven to get out the door every day in all yeah. kinds of weather to um, to be able to train and to focus on a goal of, say, participating in a race. Mm-hmm. So um, so they're driven by, by nature. Um, people always ask me, what my best accomplishment is. And and I think about it all the time and I've done all kinds of different things, but I usually come back with the standard line that my best accomplishment is my next one, you know, because you really shouldn't be living in the past. You should use your past as a confidence builder that, um, that if you've done something in the past, it just means that, you know, you probably have the wherewithal to continue and to, continue to achieve things in the present and plan for for the future. So, um, you know, runners are generally motivated by goals and, and targets and and um, always looking for the, for the next challenge. Wow, yeah, that's, I mean, I can definitely see how you uh, are very motivational when you're talking, and that, that's great. That brings me on to my next question. Um, in addition to being known as the race director of the Boston Marathon, you're a well-known motivational speaker, as you just demonstrated. Is there a particular way you come up with your inspiring presentations? Uh, is it during those tough parts in the challenges and the races you've conquered? Yeah. Or is it well, seeing others overcome obstacles? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, when I give my, my motivational talks, they're all based on personal experiences. Um you know, I'm 60 years old, so I've been around for a little while. <laughs> so I've experienced some things. I've been involved in this industry for the better part of my entire life, 35-plus yep, yep. um, years. So I've seen almost everything there is to see mm-hmm. and experienced almost everything there is to experience, both as a um, as an athlete but also as, a, as someone on the other side of the fence, as an event producer, director. Um, and a lot of times, um, what I love about running is when, when you go out the door, you leave behind the cell phone, you leave behind the computer, mm-hmm. you leave behind all the distractions, and you're able to just think and be in the moment and come up with your most creative thoughts. And for me, um, I do something very different than most people. Um, I don't know who else does this, but instead of going out for a run and wearing a uh, headset and listening to music and just kind of going off into never never land um i carry with me a voice recorder and um because i think when i'm running i come up with my best thoughts and i don't want to lose them so i run with a voice recorder and i record all my unique ideas and thoughts and then when i get home i uh, write them down and and then I'm able to use those um, going going forward. So, and the other thing is, is that in terms of just all the inspiring things that are going on in the world, um, just by virtue of being involved in this industry and surrounding yourself with people who are motivated and people who are driven, um, every event I participate in or every event. I manage, um, there, are, there are hundreds, if not thousands of people who, um, who have interesting stories. Anytime yeah. I give a talk, I always say to the audience, you know, any one of you could be standing up where I am now mm-hmm. and tell your own human interest story, and it would be just as inspiring and as motivating as maybe mine might be for some people. So... We're all human interest stories in our own right. Wow, that's that's interesting. I love the idea about the voice recording. 
during the months. I actually think about that a lot. How yeah. some things you think about and you can't remember them when you get back. So that's great. <laughs> um, I have to ask, what is your favorite motivational quote if you had to pick one? I make up my own. <laughs> that's great. And um, I have a lot of them. You know, the worst injustice you could ever do is to underestimate your own ability. Yeah. From your book, that one? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, the, the big one for me is my motto, which is my game, my rules. In other words, live life the way you want to, not the way others uh, think you should. Don't let other people discourage you from doing things that you want to do and you feel you have earned the right to do set goals, not limits. Yeah. yeah. So there's so many different inspiring monikers, uh, mottos, or quotes that we all have a tendency of gravitating to and living by. And every once in a while, you have to take those out again and remind yourself uh, of them because, um, you know, there's hills and valleys for everyone, no matter how driven you are and mm -hmm. passionate you are and People look at me and say, wow, you're so lucky. You you seem to always want to accomplish things and do things, and you always seem motivated and driven and determined and most of the time. But but I also have my moments. You know, we're, we all have. Uh, we're not immune to the challenges and the hurdles in, in life, whether it be physically or whether it be business-wise or within your own family structure. Yeah. Um so we all have, you know, again, challenges to have to overcome. So every now and then, even those of us who try to motivate other people, motivate other people have to be motivated ourselves. So to have these quotes and to have these sayings to sort of keep you, keep you honest, um, you know, it really helps not only me, but um, those around me. So. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. And I've always thought the, the down times always make you appreciate those ups even more. Right. So those quotes help pull you out of those downs sometimes. Yeah. So you have run uh, 126 marathons and eight Ironmans, if I have that correct? Yeah, that's a few great. more since whenever okay. the last time I updated it. I think I'm up to 136 marathons. Wow. Okay. Just, mm -hmm. just did my ninth. Hawaii, I and am that was yep. And uh, anyone who's completed a marathon can attest that every marathon is hard, no matter how fast, how slow, what the course is like, everything, whether it goes well or not. But what would your best and worst marathon experience be? Well, you know, interestingly, the concept of your worst marathon, I, I actually don't look at any of them as being bad okay. or my worst. The way I look at it is if I can participate in one, if I can answer the starting gun, I'm just fortunate in and of itself. And then if I can cross the finish line, no matter what happened between the gun and the finish line, again, I'm very fortunate in one of very, very few people on the planet Earth that has been able to do this. And it's interesting when I stand at the finish line directing a race and see people crossing the finish line, I might shake their hand and, and say to them, hey, congratulations, how'd you feel? And they may sometimes sort of say, well, I felt okay, but my hip bothered me and my knee kind of this, and I shouldn't have stopped for the burger and the beer or whatever, <laughs> say, and, and they, they're just disappointed. Yeah. And I try to say, wait a minute, you shouldn't be disappointed. You just ran a marathon. Yeah, you might not have achieved a certain time that you set for yourself, but you're alive. You woke up this morning. You just ran 26.2 plus miles. You know, be grateful for that, at least for the time being. And then, you know, there's always tomorrow. There's always the next one. So you can, you can, you know, correct things that went wrong or train a little harder or get better conditions, but um, savor the moment. And, so I don't really look at any marathon that I've run as being the worst one per se. I look at all of them as being a learning experience. In terms of my, my best one, I think the, the, one of the most satisfying ones was because now I direct the Boston Marathon, I'm not, I'm not able to run with everyone else when the gunfight is at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning or mm -hmm. whenever. And so, 
I direct it during the day, and then once pretty much everyone is done, I go back out to the start and um, and run it myself with a couple of friends. And so for the last 27 years, I've been the very last finisher mm-hmm. of the Boston Marathon. And for me, that's okay. My name's not in any record book, and it doesn't have to be, mm-hmm. you know, because it's just a very personal thing that mm-hmm. I want to continue to run it. And I've run it now for the last 42 years in a row. And, and last year when... Mm-hmm you know, when the incidents occurred at Boston, I was actually out at the start ready to ready to begin my run. Wow. And then I got the phone call what had happened and and hurried back to the finish to help help out there. So I wasn't able to, to run the race that year in two thousand thirteen on on Patriots Day like everyone else. But out of respect for what was going on, I, I waited a number of days and then eleven days later I went back out to the start and ran the marathon and finished. And I just felt like, you know, I needed to put closure on my experience too. And again, similar to my moniker, my game, my rules, I just decided that, you know, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't race day, but, um, for me, it, it was to, it was an extended period of time to get the job done, but I, I was able to sort of, like I said, put closure on it for myself. So I would, I would probably put that one up there as the most satisfying one, I guess. Yeah, I guess that would have been a very personal experience for you as well, just being the race director, something that you yourself wanted to find closure for, as you said, and um, something that was important to you. And that's, yeah, I think that's, that's, you know, we, we learned a lot about the running community after that event and that you proved that even more. So uh, as you already shown us you're very inspirational and motivational with your uh, approach to running but did you ever consider quitting was there any moment in time that you thought I've had enough I mean I know I even go through those every now and again so yeah well one other thing I know you had asked me was what's how's my perspective changed on Mm -hmm. on running during during my years as a runner and you know when I started out I was obviously much younger, and um, it was all all about competition then. I mean, it was, you know, the, the gun would fire, and we wouldn't think about finishing, or would we finish? We would think about how fast we could finish in, and who we would beat in the process. <laughs> and so it was really very, like I said, very competitive, very athletic, um, trained really, really hard, knew the competition knew the people who were lined up next to you, Mm -hmm. knew who they were, what their PRs were, probably how fit they were on that particular day. And a lot of times I could look at the field, which was much smaller than they are today, and say, one, two, three, four, five, six, (laughs) seven, I'm going to finish eighth. Inevitably, probably finish right around eighth, you know, just because we all went to the same races and, and knew each other. And, but then that, sort of all went away a little bit, you know, the competitive side of it. And it became more of a, more of a participatory activity than it did a competitive one for me anyways. And I think for a lot of people and the industry at large, the second running boom was, was about participation, not competition. Whereas the first running boom after Frank Shorter won in Munich, then, um, you know, people, people said, Hey, I, I want to do that. And then the whole introduction of philanthropy into the industry gave, gave people confidence and the walls of intimidation crumbled and people started believing that they could get off the couch and, and be part of this movement and had a greater purpose for doing this, not just a personal one, but but one where they were helping those who couldn't. Mm-hmm. And so it just changed. And so it changed for the industry and it changed for me personally. But now as I turned 60 uh, recently, it became a little bit more competitive again. I said, you know, I want to, the beauty about this industry is that now because of the age group dynamic where you can now be competitive with those in your age group versus Mm -hmm. competitive with the entire, entire race, the entire field, it, it adds another dimension and it gives you another another goal to achieve and so that really has 
spurred me on in the last year, and it's just fun. It, it, it's not it's not overly serious. I don't take it yeah. too serious, yeah. but it is kind of fun to see how you perform against those who, um, you know, who, who are in your your age group. But um, have I ever thought about quitting? You know, the running itself or participating? Never. You know, I obviously as I get older. I always look at people almost like, you know, in very simplistic forms, like mm-hmm. we're all like automobile, mm-hmm. whereas you could have a, a car that doesn't have a lot of miles on it, but it could be 30 years old and it's going to run pretty well because yeah. you just didn't put a lot of miles on it. Yeah. So it's not as much how old you are alone. It's how many miles you put on your body. And mm-hmm. for me, I run about 150,000 miles. So I've obviously taxed my body and put a lot of miles on it. So yeah. As I get older, I feel it more. I'm very fortunate that I haven't suffered any debilitating injuries that have kept me from running for any extended period of time. But I, but it is it is becoming more challenging, and <laughs> I'm not as I'm you know not as springy and not as fast as I once was. But I still enjoy getting out there, and the thought of ever not doing this has never entered my mind. In fact, just the opposite, the thought of if anything ever did happen where I couldn't do it has actually scared me yeah. and, and made me nervous, like, oh, my goodness, what would happen if I could do this? Yeah. And this past year, I got back into triathlon for the first time in 25 years and started swimming again and started lifting weights again and started biking again and What I enjoyed about that is I was able to get my certain dose of of exercise, but in a different form. And as a result of that, I just felt even much better physically. And I I, I think it helped me from getting injured. I wasn't running as much because I was I was swimming and biking a lot too. So so all of that really helped out an awful lot. So um, you know, and people as far as running is concerned, yeah, it is not easy. And you know, when you sort of commit to it, you know what you're getting into, you know what you're signing up for. Yeah. And um, so you have to have to put it in perspective and and know there's going to be a, a certain level of discomfort, but mm-hmm. again, it's no pain, no gain. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great way of looking at it. And it's interesting to hear how um, you have changed over the years and how... Now it's really all about getting the most out of it, whereas I know I can be guilty of admitting that I'm still in that phase of being competitive <laughs> <Yeah. Okay. laughs> too, too much. So yeah. um, so is there a go-to thought or pattern that you have in a race when you're really struggling or a moment where you're really having a tough time to kind of pull yourself out? I mean, I'm guessing your motivational quotes are a big part of that. Well, I, I actually... Um, I thrive on those moments. Mm -hmm. Um, So I look at the total experience when it's easy or easier. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a great feeling because you feel like, okay, I did the work. It's the, it's a good day. The conditions are good. The course is a good course. Maybe I can pluck out a, a faster time, but when it's difficult, you know, the time concept goes out the window Mm -hmm. and then just finishing is now the new, concept and getting through it and um, the process of getting through it, whether it be mentally, physically, or even emotionally, becomes the new challenge. And yeah, you get disappointed when you cross the finish line and you haven't met your time goals or whatever that might be. But I also give myself credit for getting through a difficult day. And I extend that into other aspects of life. So I say to myself, well, if I could get through that marathon under those conditions, it was really windy or was really nasty weather or was very um, hilly, very hot. The conditions made it more difficult. Then I I use that as a confidence builder to to achieve and accomplish other challenges in life too. So I use my running not not just for the health and fitness benefits, but also for the benefits that I'm able to to use in other aspects of life. Hmm. Interesting way of looking at it. 
<laughs> As runners, we often think we're invincible and we're exempt from all health issues. I know I'm very guilty of this, especially I feel a bit entitled when I've uh, had a hard workout that I can sit down all day and not worry about it. But you were diagnosed with coronary heart disease a few years ago. And uh, we have a lot of older listeners who would be very interested to hear how you've changed your approach to training as you've aged, either as a result of that or just in general. Well, that's the, that's the new story for me now. <laughs> I've done uh, about 18, 1900 motivational talks and none of them ever focused on this new challenge that I've been up against and as you said, a lot of us who compete or who participate in, in running a triathlon and any mass participatory athletic endeavor sometimes have this, this idea that we are invincible, that we can, we can accomplish anything, which is a great attitude, but it's probably an unrealistic one too. And I was out running about a year and a half ago and was experiencing some breathing difficulty when I started running and then eventually would dissipate throughout the run. But I knew something was not right. And so I had all these tests done, echocardiograms and stress tests and EKGs. And, and um, they didn't find anything. And they said, you know, for the most part, you, you, you're fine. And I said, well, I'm not fine. I can't breathe. <laughs> so... Um, you know, my doctor and I just agreed to take the big boy tests and look under the hood a little bit more and we did a CAT scan and an angiogram and they found a lot of narrowing of arteries and blockage and all this and I was shocked because I did never expected to see that. So on the one hand, I was really disappointed that that was the news, but on the other hand, I was, I was glad that we found the, the cause. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we all have a tendency of treating the problem, but you have to you have to get to the root of the problem, which is the cause, yeah. in order to fix it. And I found the cause of my breathing discomfort, and so now I said I have to I have to fix this. So while I was lying on the operating table, looking at the monitor, seeing all what was going on inside my own body, I turned to my doctor and said. Hey, I have one question. He said, what? And I said, is this reversible? And he said, well, it depends on the person. I said, okay, well, you're talking to him. He mm -hmm. said, oh, you? Yeah, it's, it's reversible if you do the right thing. And I said, well, sign me up. <laughs> Let's get going here. And so from that very second, that very moment, I just made it, made a huge transformation. And, um, you know, like you just said, you go out for a 20-mile run, you come home, and you feel like you've earned the right to have something, whether it be, you know, a bowl of ice cream or whatever it might be as a reward that you're going to burn it off anyways on your next run, that if the furnace is hot enough, it'll burn, and all these sort of different things. And I, I broke some of the rules. I wasn't getting enough rest because I've always felt that sleep is overrated. <laughs> I wanted to get as much out of every day as I could. You know, the stress that I put on myself, you know, whether it be through what happened at Boston or just family life or business life or whatever it might be, taking things too seriously. So I just said all that just adds up. Yeah, I have a history in my family of, of heart disease, so that contributed to it. But it was also self-inflicted, too. And I said, I can't change my genetics, but I can change my lifestyle. And so I did. And I lost 27 pounds, which I didn't have a lot to lose, but <laughs> I took it. You know, it just made me lighter, so it made me faster. Lowered my cholesterol level by over 100 points. And, and I made, made the commitment to to do the Ironman triathlon again, just as a magnet, as a target, something to get out of bed and strive for every day. And, yeah, yeah. and, um, and I, so I went over there and, and did it. And right before going, I had to sort of present the uh, Ironman organization with a letter from my doctor saying that I was okay to do it. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back to the Mass General Hospital, have another angiogram performed, and 
The results were that I had reversed my severe coronary artery disease by over 40% wow. um, on my own. So, you know, the, the whole takeaway, I guess, from all of this is that just because you're fit doesn't mean you're healthy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I have, I've had a lot of friends, um, over half a dozen who, who were great athletes who went out for a run one day and, you know, never, never come home because they didn't know, they didn't get a second chance. So my sort of, um, lesson here for everyone is, is just, um, even though we may exercise a lot and run a lot, doesn't mean that gives us <laughs> clearance to kind of not do the right things nutritionally and, and otherwise to, to keep, keep our health where it needs to, where it needs to be. So. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's great. I, I feel like you're talking to me a little bit there with, uh, sometimes I can go a little mm -hmm. overboard with the sweets as well. So I wasn't expecting well, I think, that. I think, <laughs> you know, you know, what's funny is I think sometimes the most vulnerable people can mm -hmm. be the most fit people. Because we're, we're not thinking along those lines. Anytime we feel something, we always take it as a challenge yeah. versus as a warning. And that's that's the difficulty with us. There's two types of pain, a challenge in pain and a warning pain. And you have to be able to distinguish between the two. You know, it, it's okay to, to feel something and say, I'm going to go get it checked versus, oh, I can... I can run through this. I can fight through this. Yeah. I can battle through this and just ignore, you know, the warning signs. And I've had what seems like hundreds is probably dozens of people write to me from all over the country once they heard my story and said, you know, I, I've had similar feelings. So because I heard what happened to you and I said, if it can happen to him, it can happen to me. I went and I got checked. And my doctor wouldn't even let me out of the hospital and put three stents in me. And as a result, you helped save my life. And I want to thank you for that. Now, that's breathtaking. When people write to you like that, you don't even know who they are. And they're telling you that you helped save their lives because of, you know, what you experienced and, and being, being willing to share that experience with others. Wow. Well, yeah. I, I, I it was interesting what you were saying about um, how we take it as a challenge. That can be a good thing for us for the most part, as we talked about at the beginning of the interview. But sometimes even with running pains, you know, you, you get a pain and you think, oh, well, I'm stronger than this. I'm going to run through this. But sometimes you could end up with a fracture or it could be worse. So sometimes we need to take a step back and listen to that voice that's saying stop. <laughs> yeah, it's being, being smart. Mm -hmm. Versus, you know, trying to be, be tough. Yeah. <laughs> so what advice would you give to individuals whose bodies are no longer able to handle as much running or they keep breaking down, but they want to stay in the sport? Well, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people too, <laughs> you know, and um, I think I have it all in perspective and that's what everyone has to um, have to do is to keep it in perspective. It's just the way it is that you, you can't do today what you were able to do yesterday mm -hmm. or years ago. I wrote a book called The Last Pick, and um, it's about when I was a kid, I was always the last pick when my friends bucked up the sides, and I always wanted to be an athlete, but it was very difficult because I kept getting cut, or I was always being the last one picked by my friends, so emotionally, that was, that was devastating mm -hmm. for me. The feeling of not being wanted or, you know, people feeling, my own peers feeling that I wasn't good enough to be part of, part of their team. And that's why I, that's why I started running because no one can, no one can cut you from running, you know, and it was sort of an individual thing and you just go out there and run and your performances basically are evidence of um, your athleticism, not somebody you know, scoring you or choosing you. And then the, the, the last chapter of my book is called Changing the Rules. And what I mean by that is as you age, you, you have to sort of step back and reassess and change the rules. That's okay. Still need rules. My game, my rules, your rules. 
So you just have to sort of put it all in perspective and have reasonable expectations. And I always believe in um, setting yourself up for success and not failure. Don't don't set unrealistic goals where you're not going to be able to achieve them and then you get disappointed and you quit. When I, I ran across the United States back in 1978, averaging 40, 50 miles every single day and ran 3,452 miles and People say to me, wow, how'd you do that? Run 3,400 miles. And I said, well, I didn't do it all at once. <laughs> you know, I broke it up into little pieces. You know, I chipped away one step at a time. And my goal, I had, it took me 80 days to run across America, and I had 80 goals to get through each day, one at a time. I wasn't thinking of day two on day one. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of day one. Get through that, and then think about day two. You know? mm -hmm. So it's, you know, handling it in smaller smaller chunks, and then creating immediate gratification that you did it, and it you motivate yourself to move on to the next one. And so those are the types of things that, that I do to sort of get through these situations and, and also to keep my, my running in perspective. Yeah, when I, I go to races now and the gunfires and all these young kids just blast ahead and I say to myself, I'm going to get them, you know, down the road at mile 13 or mile 18 or whatever the distance I'm running, they're going to come back and I'm, I'm going to get them. And the fact of the matter is I don't because <laughs> they're young, you know, and they can do this and I can't. So I, I just have to reassess and say, well, you know, I, I should be just competitive with myself and with those in sort of in my world mm -hmm. and not not worry about or think about, you know, what what I used to be able to do. And I, I catch myself, you know, and a lot of times we we look back, we look at the results from 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and, oh, I, I used to run 230 for the marathon, and now I'm lucky if I can break four hours. And, and sometimes I'm running a marathon, and I cross the halfway point, and I stop, not stop, but I, I think that, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, at this point in the race, I was done. I was done. I was crossing the finish line, not crossing the halfway point. And that, that, can, that can sting, you know, the reality of that. But again, that's where you have to sort of emotionally put that behind and say, I'm still out here doing it, though. Yeah. And there's a lot of people my age who were doing it with me back then who aren't doing it anymore mm -hmm. and at least take that and feel satisfied that you're able to continue to be out there doing it. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's and I, I even feel sometimes that I can do that and I, I've, you know, got plenty of years left to go. So that's, that's, I think every age could take that advice and, and run mm -hmm. with it. Um, so Boston marathon is one of, if not the most loved ma marathon in America. Uh, what would, advice would you give to race directors who want their races to grow? I know you focus a lot on critiquing and analyzing what went right and what went wrong, but could you explain a little or maybe give suggestions to other race directors out there? Well, first of all, I think every race is different. Every race mm -hmm. has its own character. Mm -hmm. You have Boston, you have New York City, you have Chicago. I mean, every race sort of focuses on something different. With Boston, it's history, tradition, you know, because we're the oldest running marathon in the world. And and um, so what what we're all about is very different than, say, what New York is all about, which is probably very different than what Chicago is all about. My point being is don't try to be like someone else. Sort of look at who you are and what you are or what you want to be and focus on that, every race is, is sort of unique and, and has specific characteristics that are very different than, than other races, and so you want to focus on those. I've always been about quality versus quantity. Um, at the end of the day, it's nice to have all the fluff and the nice expos and merchandise and T-shirts and clinics and all the technology and that's all fun stuff, enhancements, but truly what happens 
between when the gun fires and when the run across the finish line where the rubber hits the road, if you will, is in my opinion, the most important thing. And really where the runner experience is, is paramount. So I always just want to make sure we're covering the basics and not taking our, our eye off the ball and trying to do too many fluffy things and forget about, you know, having enough water or making sure people are going in the right direction and not going off course and making the race safe for everyone. Those are the things that are continually be important to me and, and they don't just fall out of the sky. For me, I'm all about the concept of um, people People always say, wow, that was that was a great race. That, that race director, wow, he put out a lot of fires. Well, I don't want to put out fires. Um, I want to prevent them. You know, and a lot of times when someone puts out a fire, you know, they they look at it like a hero for putting out the fire. And I look at look at them like, well, wait a minute, you probably are the one who, who caused it. You know, you didn't plan well enough. So that's why the situation occurred to begin with. And those of us who, who work harder behind the scenes or work on plan B, C, D, and E, you may not get the credit because if your race goes well, then people just have a tendency of taking it more for granted that it, that it just happened. But those are the true race director type heroes in my, in my opinion. I think the key here is I don't, I don't consider myself as much a race director anymore. I consider myself more as a conductor, like a conductor of an orchestra. And I try to surround myself with the best, most experienced musicians, technicians that I can, I can assemble because it's really the orchestra that makes it work. Yeah, it's important that the conductor be there, but, um, it's delegating and surrounding yourself with with a good team. And this industry is it's rewarding, but it's very labor intensive. There's a lot of work that goes into these things. It's a business now. Years ago it wasn't as much. It was funny when asked what I did for a living, you know, twenty five years ago I used to mumble, <clears throat> I'm a race director. You know, you're a what? I'm a race director. What do they do? You know, they just put a chalk mark in the road and yell go. <laughs> well, you know, back then that's kind of what it was. I mean, there wasn't a real lot to it. And now when people say to me, what do you do for a living? I say to them, well, I, I help raise the level of self-esteem and self-confidence of tens of thousands of people in America. And they're like, really? Said, yeah, really. That's what we do. We give people an opportunity to sort of set goals use our event as a, as a target to have the guts to sign an application, which is arguably the most difficult part of running a race or a marathon is signing the application, making that commitment, doing the work, earning the right to answer the starter's gun, getting through the course, crossing the finish line, getting the medal, and guess what? Going home feeling good about yourselves. And there's nothing more rewarding to an event director than that, knowing that people have sort of left in a better way than, than when they arrived. You know, it's funny, I have a, a button in my office that says, my job's secure because no one else wants it. <laughs> um, and I'm being somewhat facetious in, in sort of saying that, but when I, when I talk at, at audiences, like right before the marathon, and there's 400 people out there. And I say, how many people are running the marathon tomorrow? And every hand goes up in the audience. And I say, okay, how many people are directing the marathon tomorrow? You know, and I just kind of am the only one that puts my hand up and say, well, the odds kind of stink, right? I mean, because all of you and only a handful of us. And so it's, it's a lot of pressure. But um, I always look at pressure as being a privilege. It's a privilege to do these things. And... When kids especially ask me what I do for work, I sort of say, well, I, I don't work. And they say, you don't work? And I said, nope. Oh. Well, how do you earn a living? And I said, well, I enjoy what I do so much that I don't, I don't really consider it work. You know, and isn't that, isn't that such a good thing? Imagine if everyone could wake up every day and, and just head off to work, which is something they're passionate about. And they don't consider it work and they would do it even if they weren't being compensated. And if you have to do it 
eight to ten hours a day of this thing, you know, wouldn't it be great is this if you were driven and passionate and could hardly wait to get up every morning to get at it. That's how it is for me. No, that's great. That's what we're always told you know, you should strive for is a, a job that doesn't feel like a job. So it's great that you've reached that. So that's all I have. But uh, our athletes and fans have submitted some questions over the past few weeks. So I just wanted to just have a kind of quick fire question for you. So sure. our first one is uh, from Doug Petrick. Uh, this comes, this is about the Boston Marathon. When you first started as the race director, did you ever envision it would become as big as it is today? Well, you know, it's interesting, the Boston Marathon, there's, there's two types of events for me. One is an event that already existed that I'm coming in helping out with. And then there are events that haven't existed that I have to help give birth to. And both of those are interesting challenges to create something from nothing and use my creative juices and design it and develop it any way I want is kind of refreshing and exciting. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, to come into an event like the Boston Marathon that has been around for mm -hmm. as long as seemingly dinosaurs have roamed this earth, I, I always say that I'm just a caretaker of this event. I, it was here before I was born, and it'll be here long after I'm gone. I'm just taking care of it <laughs> for a few years. And um, so in terms of, you know, when I first got involved 28 years ago, did I ever imagine it would be what it is today? Well, it was then <laughs> what it is today. It was the premier marathon in the world. It was the most prestigious marathon in the world. It was the Holy Grail. It was the Super Bowl. It was the World Series. It was the Kentucky Derby. It was the Tour de France. All rolled into one. This was where the running mecca, this is where people set their sights on the Boston Marathon. This is the Olympics for rank and file. So, you know, when I ran my first one, I was in awe of the fact that I was running in the race. When I got offered the job to help direct it, I was in awe of now running the race. Mm -hmm. So running in it or running it, directing it, both sort of are the pinnacle <laughs> of, of this industry. And, you know, I, I don't take it for granted. And I'm very, very fortunate to be able to now do both. Is I'm the only one that does both. Yeah, well, I know a lot of our... Um a lot of our athletes and a lot of our fans are very interested in Boston as their, their primary goal, qualifying for the race. Uh, we had quite a few questions about um, how you will accommodate more qualifiers in the future, if there's any way you plan on changing the process with that fine line of whether you qualify or not, or if there's any changes you see coming. Well, a couple of things. One is, even though I'm the race director, I'm, I'm only one person. Yeah. There's a board. There's staff, there's an organizing committee. I mean, there's a lot of people, obviously, that make this thing happen. I'm just one of many. And um, I certainly don't take the credit for everything that happens at that race. That being said, in terms of those particular questions, you know, as far as Boston is concerned, like any race, there are two two things that, that we are we are challenged with. One is real estate space and two is time on the road and both of those sort of dictate how many people you can accommodate since Boston started 119 years ago we have no more space today than they had 119 years ago practically you know they started off with a couple of dozen runners on a course that the course today is about the same, that we ha we are now accommodating 30 plus thousand people. So you have to be real creative as to how you manage that. And then it takes a lot longer, i.e. road closure, to accommodate that. And even though it is what it is in terms of the status of, of the race and those who are impacted by it, residents and businesses along the route, 
understand that and accept that and support that, they have to go on with their daily life too. You can't just shut these roads down for yeah. 24 yeah. hours. So all that means is that there's a field size limit. And so there's more people who want in than we have space to accommodate. And therein lies and how the qualifying standards were created is to uh, control the growth of the event. And that's what I'm, I was saying before about quality versus quantity. And when you have something that seemingly everybody wants to be a part of, that's probably the most challenging part of directing the race or man helping to manage the race for all of us is that leaving people on the curb and not being able to accommodate everybody. We wish we could, but we can't. And um, that's why every year we'll step back and look at the qualifying standards. We'll look at the registration process and procedure, and we'll, we'll evaluate it and just say, what do we need to do? Do we need to do anything? Do we need to change things in order to maintain a level of fairness and to accommodate as many as possible? And like I said, the advent of philanthropy now has entered our industry in a good way. And millions and millions and millions of dollars are being raised for worthwhile causes, saving lives as a result. So we're trying to, there's a delicate balance there between, you know, accommodating and accepting as many, if not all, those who earn the right by qualifying to be here, as well as those who want to run for, for another reason. And so we have a certain percentage of qualifiers and a certain percentage of those who don't qualify, but that Ray run to raise money for worthwhile causes. And I think that you know, you can coexist, and we have, and I think we've done a really good job in that, in maintaining that delicate balance. Yeah, I would agree, and I think, you know, no matter what standard or method you use, there's always going to be some people who just miss out or just miss that standard, so as as far as I can see, it's, it's frustrating for some, but it's fair, as you mentioned. And it's fair, I think that the standards are there, and it's up to the individual now to put themselves in a position where they meet the standard. Then if they don't, then they have to work a little harder and try again and try again and try again. And that, that's just what separates our race from, from others. And like I said before, that's why we're different than New York than Chicago. Other, you know, it might be a rush to the keyboard or it may be a lottery and you just have to be lucky. Mm -hmm. But with our race it has nothing to do with luck. It has to do with the pursuit of athletic excellence. Yep. yep. That's yep. what we're all about. No, that's, that's great. Dave, we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. As Dave mentioned, he does have a book, uh, as he mentioned, The Last Pick, which you can find on Amazon. I'll also put a link in the show notes. As he talked about, this is about never underestimating your ability to set and achieve goals. It's very inspirational. And as you've learned today, Dave has a lot of knowledge and experience about how to get the best out of yourself. You can also find more about Dave on his website. That's dmsesports.com. I know I enjoyed uh, listening today and talking to you. I'm sure our audience saw a whole different side of you today, in a good way, obviously. <laughs> but thank you, Dave, for taking the time to...